Well, we're bringing the month of May to a close with this last sermon in a series I called God's Gift of Memory. It was my hope and desire that we could gain a new appreciation for this most magnificent and wonderful God-given gift. We often uh, mock and, and laugh at it, of course, in our uh, state. Uh, there's no denying that we don't remember the things that uh, we used to as clearly as we used to, but it certainly doesn't mean that we forget everything. Uh, and um, even more than that, it doesn't allow us to be let off the hook when it comes to remembering certain things about life and faith. As I said last week, I might forget my wedding anniversary, but I can assure you it would only happen once. Um, there are some things we just aren't allowed to forget. Um, we have this great gift of memory. We began the series by remembering Jesus through the words of the Lord's Supper. Do this in remembrance of me. And we remembered on the, as we take the Lord's table. It's not a ritual that we engage in simply to take up worship time. It's not something that we do. Uh, we don't approach the table casually or flippantly, but with reverence, with humility, with gratitude, all the while remembering the body of Christ, remembering the blood of Christ, remembering ultimately that he will return. That's one thing that we sometimes forget to emphasize as we partake of the Lord's table, but he says to do this until he comes again. And we remember his return two weeks ago. We remembered our mothers through the words, the words of Proverbs 31, a wife of noble character who can find charm is deceitful, beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord shall be praised. Remember those words. We were encouraged to honor and remember our mothers for the value of their worth, the value of their work, and the victory of their walk. And then, then last week we looked at another passage of Scripture that calls us to remember, calls us to engage our memories, and that is the words of Exodus 20 and verse 8, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And we sought to remember with our minds and rest our bodies and Rejoice in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. And finally today, because of it being Memorial Day weekend, I want us to remember the sacrifice. Remember and honor those who ultimately paid the price that we could live freely. Just a little bit about Memorial Day. It was originally called Decoration Day. It's a day of remembrance for those who have died in our nation's military service to be distinguished from Veterans Day, which honors all veterans, not just those who have died in service, Memorial Day being specifically for those having died in service. It was officially proclaimed on May the 5th of 1868 by General John Logan, the third Commander-in-Chief of the Grand Army of the Republic. Now, I had to look that one up because I'm thinking, I ain't never heard of the Grand Army of the Republic. Um, it was a fraternal organization composed of veterans from the Union Army. It was first observed on May 30th of 1868 when flowers were placed on the graves of the Union and Confederate soldiers at Arlington National Cemetery. The first state that officially recognized the holiday was New York. They did so in 1873, although I should say many southern states had been remembering their deceased soldiers and decorating their graves from as early as 1861. We're always looking for a one-up somewhere. Um, while Waterloo, New York was officially declared the birthplace of Memorial Day, Memorial Day by President Lyndon Johnson in 1966, it's uh, rather difficult to uh, conclusively prove the origins of the day. All in all, it's a day that we remember and honor those for giving of themselves, for securing our freedoms, for defending the innocent, for protecting and preserving democracy. All of us would agree that those who did so are good men and women indeed. And while our government is still in the market for folks that want to prove themselves worthy of serving in the United States military, I want you to know this morning that God is still in the market for those who are not ashamed of the gospel. God is still in the market for those who would be a voice crying in the wilderness. God is still in the market for those who would not buckle under the weight of the cares and the concerns of this age and for those that will not be entangled in the things that so easily distract us. Titus 2.14 says, Jesus gave himself for us 
that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. On this Memorial Day, may we begin by remembering that Jesus is still looking for people who are willing to take up the challenge to fight the good fight of faith and for whom will not shrink back. David had a few of these people himself. In fact, he had several that were dedicated to him and were loyal to his causes. He had two groups of men, actually three, if, if you really get picky, but, but two in particular, the three and the thirty. Um, I'm, I'm going to call them the, the three, the two, and the thirty, um, and you'll see why in just, in just a moment. Um, there are two sections of scripture that give us the details of these men. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 23, verses 8 to 12, and then 1 Chronicles 11, which you heard me read earlier. Um, both of those sections describe these men and some of their uh, work, and, and they're not exact copies, but they're very close and very, very similar. Uh, in that regard, and I should point out that there are some textual issues with these verses, and most of your Bibles, in fact, will have some type of a footnote about the different name spellings uh, and origins and help to clarify uh, what might at first glance appear to be contradictions. In 2 Samuel 23, verses 8 to 12, uh, the first group of mighty men are described, and I'm going to show them to you. The first one is Josheb uh, Bashebeth. Uh, he's also co called uh, Joshua Beam in First Chronicles. Uh, and again, I'm not going to go into the details. You can look at your footnotes and it'll take you back. Uh, it has to do with the translation from uh, the Greek and in the, in the Hebrew. But uh, he's, he's attributed to either killing 800 or 300 men. If you go to Second Samuel, it's 800. In First Chronicles, it's 300. Uh, the reason for the discrepancy is usually given to a misreading of the numbers uh, when copying the text, but I like to imagine that this guy was um, sitting in a bar with his buddies after the battle saying, you know, I just kind of stopped counting after 300. Uh, could have been 800, who knows, you know, what's another 500? Um, that's kind of how I like to imagine this, this issue. Of, of course, it's also likely that he didn't kill all 300 or all 800 himself, but rather uh, it's more likely that he started the attack and others came in and joined. And then when it was all said and done, it, the final outcome was attributed to him where he didn't actually kill all 800. Of course, he could have. I, I'm not saying that he didn't. So please don't misunderstand. The second guy that we come across is Eliezer. This guy was, um, uh, he was, he was a, an interesting character. While other guys, while the, while the nation of Israel was was fleeing um, from a battle, um, he stood his ground and he fought until his sword was wielded, uh, welded, excuse me, welded to his hand. If you've ever um, chopped wood, uh, if you've ever used a hammer for a long period of time, you might have noticed that the nerves in your arm um, can kind of get shot to the point that they become so fatigued, you have to kind of pry your fingers off of the tool that you're using. And, and that's what happened in Eliezer's instance. He stood his ground and fought so valiantly that uh, his hand was just uh, welded to his sword. The third guy we aren't introduced to in First Chronicles 11, which is what I read for you earlier. We're not introduced to him there, but we are introduced to him in Second Samuel 23. His name is Shema. Um, his story is very similar to Eliezer's, except he stood in a, a field of lentils, a lentil field. It was property that, was, uh, that Shema understood to be the Lord's ground, the Lord's territory, and the enemy was wanting to take that. And he stood his ground, not with anyone else around, but just to protect the Lord's property uh, until the other uh, warriors from Israel could come and, and support him. And so those are the three. Uh, that um, tend to kind of be emphasized as uh, David's uh, three mighty men. Um, and then there are two others that get special mention, and that's why I mentioned the three, the two, and the thirty, because these other two guys get a special mention. The, the, their names are Abishai and, and Benai, and you heard me read about them a moment ago, but this is what the Bible tells us about Abishai. He's the brother of Joab, uh, who was the chief of the three, he raised his spear against 300 men whom he killed, and so he became as famous as the three. 
He was doubly honored above the three and became the commander, even though he was not included among the three. So he was the commander of the three and as famous as them, but was not them. He was not the three. Um, then there was Benai, and listen to this highlight reel. Uh, Benai, son of Joadiah, a valiant fighter from Kabzeel, performed great exploits. He struck down Moab's two mightiest warriors. He also went down into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. I don't know many people that chase lions anyway, but much less on a snowy day going into a hole after one. I mean, that, that guy's got some screws loose. Uh, and he struck down an Egyptian who was five cubits tall. That's seven feet, six inches tall. I stand and look at people that are that tall. I don't fight them, um, but he did. Um, and the Egyptian had a spear like a weaver's rod in his hand, and Benai went against him with a club, and he snatched the spear from the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. Now, I think, I've, I've not been in battle before, but I, I think that is not what you want to have happen, is for your own weapon to be taken from you and killed with your own weapon. I mean, that's kind of, you're just not a good warrior if that happens to you. It's one thing to be shot by someone else's gun, but have your gun taken from you in hand-to-hand -hand combat and then killed with your own gun. I mean, it's, it's a pretty bad state of affairs, and such were the exploits of Benai, son of Joadiah. He too was as famous as the three mighty warriors. He was held in great honor, uh, greater honor than any of the 30, but he was not included among the three. And so David put him in charge of his bodyguard. Pretty good move there, David. Goes in uh, after a lion and, and kills an Egyptian. You know, he can, uh, can protect me when the time comes. Finally, in both 2 Samuel 23 and in 1 Chronicles 11, we get the names of the 30 warriors. Now, I stopped shy of reading that in 1 Chronicles 11 and, and 2, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 23. Uh, you can go and attempt uh, to read all of those. There is one name that you will know, and his name was Uriah. You know Uriah the Hittite, the wife of Bathsheba. He was one of the 30 uh, that's in that list, but you can go and read those. He had some good men, David. He had men that were loyal to him and were dedicated to protecting him from Saul. In fact, they were willing to give their lives for him, and that's just what God is looking for in us. A willingness to lay aside all that we have for allegiance and loyalty to him and to his causes. You might recall these words in Mark 12, verse 30. And you shall love the Lord your God with half of your heart. Mm -mm. All of your heart. And with part of your soul. Not quite. All of your soul. And with whatever remains of your strength in your old age. No. With all of your strength. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. The disciples of Jesus were called and they were willing to lay aside all that they had to follow him. And as we consider the few verses of 1 Chronicles 11, I want us to see three things. The first thing I want us to see is David's thirst. I'm, I'm focusing in particular on verses 15 to 19. David is in a cave. You heard me read it earlier. He's in a cave in Adullam, which is about 16 miles southeast of Jerusalem. The text doesn't suggest that David's men and the Philistines were engaged in active combat at the time, only that the Philistines were encamped between where David was and between his hometown of Bethlehem. Uh, David and his men were almost certainly not without water. Uh, don't forget that David was a shrewd military commander. He would not have chosen a site without access uh, to water for his headquarters. However, what is likely is that the water that they did have, which was probably collected in the rains and kept in cisterns, um, had probably been sitting there for a while and had probably become a little bit brackish. If you've ever been down to the coast, you know there's a place where fresh water and salt water meet, and it's kind of not either one. It's, it, they come up with this word as brackish. It's, it's not all that great uh, to drink, and so that's probably what had happened. David uh, then speaks of his desire to drink from the well that is by the gate there in Bethlehem, and um, it was probably prompted more by nostalgia for good tasting water um, than for real thirst because again he probably would have had uh, water to drink from but memories in a setting like that in a cave you've got water but you, you're so close to Bethlehem and and the memories of growing up there and, and and just knowing the taste 
of that water from the well. Our memories, they're a powerful thing. They're powerful motivators. David remembered that water. He longed for that taste for home. And his men overheard him saying, Oh, that someone would give me water to drink from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. Let me ask you a couple of questions this morning. Do you long for the taste of a better time? Do you thirst for the return of better days? Do you hope for what you once had? Psalm 42, 1 says, As the deer pants for the waters of the stream, so my soul pants for you, O God. I believe that we all have memories of the past days. We often hear of how people talk about the good old days, and in retrospect, they are good days. But Jesus has come to bring us the greatest of days. He's come to bring us abundant life. If you're in the habit of writing things down, write that question down under David's thirst. What is my thirst today? Do you hope for that? Do you long for God? Does your soul pant and thirst to be refreshed with the Word of God and a relationship with Him? Does that characterize your thirst today? Is your thirst for the pure holiness that comes from a life in Christ? Or is your thirst for the brittle, brackish puddles that this world has to offer? You may be pinned in like David and surrounded by tough circumstances, but that doesn't mean that you can't have the taste of new life in Christ Jesus. He'll come into your life. He'll satisfy the deepest desires like none other, if you'll just let him. And for those of us who have already accepted his abundant life, he can do it again. When the heat of the life, of day, and all of the burdens that we face soak up our enthusiasm for Christ, he can come and fill our cup once again to overflowing. If we'll let him call out to Jesus today, he will give us the freshness of water. The second thing I want us to see in this story is David's men thrusting through in 1 Chronicles 11, verse 18. We read this, And so the three broke through the camp of the Philistines and drew water from the well of Bethlehem, which was by the gate, and took it and brought it to David. The only problem with David's thirst was that what he wanted was behind enemy lines. Bethlehem at this time was occupied by his enemies. And the truth of the matter is that what we want in the Lord is often found behind enemy lines too. And you say, well, what are those enemy lines? Well, it's everything from doubt, fear, pride, guilt. The list could go on and on, but the thing that we want is tucked in behind that enemy. David longed for the water from the wells in Bethlehem, which was in the enemy's territory. Nevertheless, David's special forces, as it were, set out to get him a drink and what they did was they placed their lives in jeopardy. They broke through the lines of their enemies and they brought back the water that David so longed for. And I want to remind you of something this morning. Someone broke through enemy lines for you and me too. Jesus broke through the power of the enemy to bring the living water that will never let us thirst again. The death and the resurrection of Jesus provided the water of life for us. And in a similar but more dramatic and life-changing way, we've been offered the refreshing waters from Bethlehem's well in the person of Jesus Christ. Do you remember the words of Jesus to the woman at the well? John chapter 4. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked Him and He would have given you living water. You recall the woman says, But sir, you have nothing to draw water with the well is deep where can you get this living water are you greater than the father jacob who gave us the well to drink from as he did himself and his sons and his livestock and jesus answered everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again but whoever drinks the water i give them will never thirst again indeed the water i give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life Folks, the neat thing is that we can't do this on our own. It's only by God the Father who has provided through Jesus Christ to whom the Holy Spirit is always pointing us. God has pressed through the enemy lines for us and has brought us back the living water, Jesus Christ. It's as if the Holy Trinity is our mighty three. 
Just as David had three men that broke through, God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have broken through to bring us what we need. Write the question down this morning as you ponder David's men's thrusting through. Jordan, give us that question, buddy. Who thrust through for you? Jesus Christ. Today isn't only a day when we remember those who defended our nation and protected our freedoms. It's also a time that we remember and honor him who sacrificed that we might be free from sin. Jesus Christ. Just as we're indebted to those who've made a sacrifice of love for us, we're even more indebted to him. Christ. He was the sacrificial lover. We give a sacrifice of praise to him this day. The third thing I want us to see this morning as we close is David threw it all away. Look back at 1 Chronicles 11, 18 and 19. The three break through. They get the water. They bring it back to David. And it says, nevertheless, David would not drink it. But he poured it out to the Lord and he said, be it far from me before my God that I should do this. Shall I drink the blood of these men who went at their risk? For at the risk of their lives, they brought it. Therefore, he would not drink it. These things the three mighty men did. What an awesome feat of dedication and love these men accomplished. And yet David couldn't drink the water that was brought to him. He reflected on the great cost of the retrieval of the water and poured out the water instead of drinking it. And, and I don't know about you, but it seems to me as you read this story, what a... What a painful thing to do to pour out the water in front of these three men who had just risked their lives. But you see, for David, the water seemed to have the price of blood on it. Just too great to take personal pleasure in. And the sacrifice of these men moved him to sacrifice that which he had asked for in the water. And he used that cup of water as an honor before the Lord. It's interesting, I, in researching the drink offering... A drink offering was um, something that was never to be done alone. When you gave a drink offering, you were also to accompany it with another type of, of offering. And in this instance, the additional sacrifice was the sacrifice of the three men. Not literally. David wasn't literally going to sacrifice one of these three men as the additional offering to go along with pouring out the cup. Rather, he was acknowledging that they risked their lives to retrieve the water. They were the sacrifice. Their actions of going were the additional sacrifice that was needed. And the question comes to me today, what about now? What about our purposes today? How does offering sacrifice work in our lives this morning? And if I understand that Jesus is the living water and that he's brought to us the one who's able to press through the enemy lines on our behalf, then we really only have one response to that someone who would give himself so willingly. And that is that we become the sacrifice. Listen to these words from the Apostle Paul. See if it makes a little bit better sense. Romans 12, 1 says, I urge you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Write this question down. Am I willing to be used? Am I, am I willing to be used by God to be a sacrifice, to show forth my great gratitude and love for His sacrifice? What does the memory of sacrificial love move you to do? How does the memory of Jesus' sacrifice motivate you today? Are you willing to speak for Him, speak of your relationship with Him to others? Do you survey the gifts and the talents that He's given to you and find ways to use them for His glory? Is your heart burdened for a particular people? Maybe it's prisoners, maybe it's sick people, maybe it's uh, hospitalized or forgotten or marginalized people, maybe it's widows or or orphans. Maybe the people that are on your heart and mind today go by a different name. Maybe the people that are on your heart, the, the folks that, that God has put a burning desire in your heart for today go by the name of family. Maybe they're neighbors. Maybe they're co-workers. Maybe they're employees. 
Does the fact that Jesus died on a cross for your sin in order that he might extend the living water to all who believe, does that move you to be the light of Christ? Are you willing to be used? I shared this verse at the beginning, Titus 2.14. Jesus gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed. Purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Recognizing and accepting the sacrifice of Jesus should cause us to be his own possession. Recognizing Jesus' sacrifice on this day should cause us to be zealous for his good deeds. You see, remembering the sacrificial love given by those service men and women for all of America's history, it ought to change us. We ought to be grateful for that freedom that we know and that we love. The things that we're able to do that others can't. The opportunities that lie before us that only others are able to dream about. We ought, we ought to, because of the sacrifice of our servicemen and women, be grateful and appreciate that. And in the same way, Christ's sacrifice of love for our benefit should change who we are and what we're about. Are you willing to be poured out for Him? Are you willing to be used? Use your humor for Him. Use your gift of hospitality for Him. Use your teaching ability or your patience and your ability to listen to people who have problems that just need to share from their heart. Maybe you have the gift of organization. Are you willing to be used? What about creativity? There are people all over that need a fresh and new look on life. Maybe you have the gift of creativity or your compassion. Maybe you have financial resources. May your very life be used for Jesus Christ. This morning, God is still searching for those who would stand and be mighty men and mighty women for Him. Will you answer the call as we remember their sacrifice? Let's pray. Our most gracious Father, we do thank